Well, the one thing that I wanted you to be aware of is that the uh, the state library is it's oh, it belongs to the people of Alaska, and um, if if you have need of uh, the kind of materials that are in that collection, please come up to the the state office building. We are, we'll be moving into our new home down down here within a couple of years. We've been making it our business in the last couple of years to make a lot of the more obscure material, uh, older manuscripts, publications that are out of print that are impossible to get. We've been trying to make those available online. Now there were a couple of things that Dennis mentioned, uh, oral histories, particularly old, older recordings. The state does have a big collection of those. And of course in Fairblanks they've been doing really good work with those. We also though have uh, the ability to um, to dub older recordings. And if there are any that are in family collections that you have, whether you want to share them with the public or not, we do have the resources to get those re-recorded. So please come in and see me about those uh, because they're vitally important. And the other thing uh, that Dennis mentioned is curriculum development. And um, of course, we recognize too the, the desperate need for good curriculum in Native Studies. Uh, both the, the uh, Department of Education and the Alaska Humanities Forum now are working on um, Alaskan history curriculum. They do need input from people with, with knowledge of uh, Native cultures. Well, thank you for letting me speak. Let's begin with our panel who are all uh, very much involved in, uh, in using and uh, creating uh, uh, literature. And let's begin with, uh, with Dick Dauenauer. Uh, if you want. Hi, <clears throat> welcome, and uh, we're happy to be here. Um, we're, uh, I think the panel is about six minutes each, so Nora and I will kind of combine on, on our books. Um, I'd like to begin by connecting to Dennis's uh, uh, talk about the body of knowledge and the most, I guess, to summarize what's here is um, a large part of that, what we, what we tried to do as uh, beginning way back 40 years ago with uh, being unaffiliated scholars, uh, also with the beginning of the Alaska uh, Native Language Center when that was first uh, funded. And then some of it was developed uh, at Sea Alaska Heritage uh, Foundation um, in the 80s and, and 90s when, when Nora and I worked there. So I'd just like to do a brief show and tell here and then Nora can comment on, on the, the ones that we've done. Uh, I'll begin with two things that are not our work, but I'd like to, to call to your attention. The first is the um, Thlingit Verb Dictionary. And this uh, is not really in two volumes, except everybody's binding falls apart, so you comb bound uh, part of this. This was developed by Connie Nash and Gillian Story uh, on their work now, probably 50, 60 years ago uh, in Angoon. This was published in 1973 by Alaska Native Language Center. Uh, it's now, it's a very difficult book to use and it's beginning to get a little bit outdated, but it's still uh, an incredibly valuable uh, um, dictionary of, of, of Tlingit. The most recent dictionary of Tlingit, which is really a remarkable and, and beautiful book is by Carrie Edwards. And um, this is published by Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. It's called the Dictionary of Tlingit. And they also have companion volumes in Ida and Simsian. Uh, this is remarkable because it has an uh, excellent grammar uh, in the beginning of it. It kind of shows you how to use it. And the verbs are documented uh, out of uh, what uh, Carrie's project over the last number of years, working with, in fact, many of the people in the room here. Um, trying to, to document Tlingit. The, the big problem as a learner of Tlingit is that it's very unpredictable. It's, it's the, of the languages I've worked with over my life, um, the most difficult one to predict. So if you, if you know one verb, you, you can't really automatically predict how some of the other verbs will work. So Akiri provides this and it's also um, goes along with an online version 
because the data would be, I don't know, thousands of pages if she were to publish all the data for every verb, but you can get it online. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, I'm not sure if it's out on the table, but the Alaska Heritage Institute um, has those. Uh, turning to our, old, our own work, uh, Nora and I began working on beginning Tlingit some 40 something years ago. And I think it still stands the test of time. It's, it's, there are a lot of new materials coming out that are, are really valuable that could be combined with this. But this will give you kind of a backbone. And it also has tape, uh, audio, uh, there's recordings in it and with the CD. So if you're, especially in a place where you, uh, no, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my train. Uh, anyhow, it's there if you're, if you're working kind of an isolation, it's, it's got CDs. Uh, Nora, uh, what do you mean by the underlines? Do, do you mean by the underlines? Yeah. Okay, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, in fact, I'll talk about it now since it came up. Uh, one of the problems we've had with Tlingit orthography from the very beginning is there's simply more sounds in Tlingit than there are letters to write them with. So we had the uh, nation story uh, way back, uh, develop the system of using underlines. Uh, the problem with the underlines is, is they don't transfer very well from program to program. They, they're very easy to get lost when you send one, a file from one person to another. And uh, a lot of the younger people now that are um, thumbing their text on the telephones are using another convention, which is very good. It's, it, it uses an H after the letter. So it's either X underline or XH. And uh, I think this is something we'll resolve in the future. It's not a big, it's not a big problem. It's just that uh, with using computers and typing and stuff, it's, uh, I wish we'd done that 50 years ago, but you know, times have changed. And, and um, anyhow, now when I did this, it's now in, in the, I think the four, third or fourth edition, uh, Sea Alaska Heritage uh, uh, has, is where you can get those. Um, we also did a, a, a book uh, way back that, um, called Tlingit Spelling Book, or An Adespelled Kuk, and that's available. It also has a CD in the back, uh, so it's, it's kind of a primer on, on how to spell. And um, <clears throat> uh, Linda Pilardi and, and uh, uh, Duffy White uh, uh, right, are beginning, I uh, will do a Sp uh, spelling bee this afternoon and using this book. So it's still around, it's, it's, it's alive and well. Uh, then we did two books at the Alaska Heritage Institute that I think are very nice. Uh, this one is a Say It and Think It, a Think It phrase book. It's, it's nice, it's got, um, I think this one has got the CD in it. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and then we did another one um, called Sneaky Sounds. And it's a uh, thing that spelling is very, very intimidating and uh, we wanted to kind of be non-threatening. So this is called a non-threatening introduction to Tlingit sounds and spelling. And it's got the CD to go with it. And uh, um, I think you can have a lot of fun with it. It's, uh, uh, and again, this, I'm, I'm not sure if Sea Alaska brought any books to the table, but uh, you can get it there if, if not. Um, I'd like to, talk about a couple of, of my own things, uh, uh, an early one and, and then a recent one. Um, this little booklet called Conflicting Visions in Alaskan Education, and we're now going into the fourth edition. It, f it was first done in 1982. Um, and I think it's a very important book, uh, uh, and we've got some out on, on the table. Um, if you're at all interested in some of what Dennis was talking about, how did things get to be this way? What was the reaction? Why such a violent reaction against native languages in the school? Where the history of this comes from? And there's some incredibly powerful quotations in here from legislators and teachers about uh, um, why native languages should be exterminated and, and they're of no use to the Tlingit people. Uh, even though one guy says they seem to understand each other, they somehow communicate in it. But really, it's it's uh, 
um, you know, it's not worth saving. And you see where these attitudes come into the public schools. So I'd really urge you, if you're at all interested in this, um, it gets you into the whole history of, of the, the school districts, the way they are now, and, and the policies. So that's, uh, as I say, 1982, and um, we're just doing our, our fourth, uh, fourth edition. We're, we're printing now. And my most recent, uh, that is out on the table, uh, Nora and I, in, in addition to what we do with at Lincoln, are also writers of our own creative writing. And this is uh, Benchmarks. It's uh, just published this, this month. And it's New and Selected Poems, 1963 to 2013. So that's out on the table. and. Uh, Destined to be a bestseller, I'm sure. And you can't you can't live without this one. It's out there. Out there. <laughs> yes, Ishmael's my fan club. <clears throat> okay. Um, now uh, f I'd like to conclude here with four of the books that we did that um, I, again uh, speak to what Dennis was talking about. You know, books that can be used in the curriculum. Uh, with this body of knowledge. And this is a, uh, based on recordings that Nora did with the elders, most of whom are no longer with us. And we can talk a little bit about, about the process, but basically uh, Nora's transcriptions, and then we argue about the translation. And this first one is Hashuka, Our Ancestors. We, we worked on this in the, in the early 1980s. <clears throat> and that's, uh, there's, there's some of these out on the, on the table. It uh, was published in the, in the 1980s, and this is Tinkett's Stories. Then um, the second book in the series is Hatuanagoyas, For Healing Our Spirit, uh, Tlingit Oratory. And these two books go together in the sense that this is how um, Tlingit clans acquire their atu. And the oratory is how they're used ceremonially uh, for the removal of grief and, and the, uh, other situations. So this is, these, these were the, uh, again, the first two that we did. Um, one of the big problems with a lot of the older uh, anthropology is that they didn't really tell who the storytellers were. The well, here's, here's a native story. You have no idea who 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 was the one that telling it so we did went out of our way to put little biographies of this of the storytellers and the speakers that went over so well that people asked us to do a biography book which is the huge door stopper don't read this in bed or, or in the bathtub it's, it's just overwhelmingly heavy but it's got the biographies again of of many many elders of the older generation and i, I don't think anybody is still alive that's in this book. They were, um, I think, all, all gone. Um, but anyhow, these are uh, how the uh, people's lives, uh, their involvement, uh, several movements here, the, the Alaska Native Brotherhood, uh, the church, the various church involvements. Then finally, um, we have been working for 20 years or so uh, material from the um, battles of Sitka uh, with the Russians and the Tlingits. And we finally got the go ahead from the clan leaders of all of the clan leaders of Sitka saying, uh, we really want to do this. Uh, it had been on the shelf because some of the older generation thought that, that because peace had been made, we, they really shouldn't talk about it anymore. But the younger people were wanting uh, the younger clan leaders so we did this Anushi uh, Tlingitanika, Russians in Tlingit America, another big one. Um, the good thing about waiting 20 years to do this is the, the Soviet Union fell apart and we had access for the first time to material by our colleagues over there. And that was wonderful. We were able to do much more with the Russian documents. So what's exciting about this book is how the Tlingit oral traditions uh, survived and how they parallel the Russian written traditions and log books and stuff like that. <coughs> And we were able to partner with Lydia Black, um, who was one of the authorities on, on Russian America. Uh, she died as the book was in, in press, uh, unfortunately. But um, 
the, the, the downside of waiting 20 years is we also lost many of the uh, Sitka elders who, who could have answered many of the questions that came up later, uh, but they were no longer around, and, and so that was the downside of that. So I'm going to conclude there and pass to Nora, who will talk about her own poetry and then anything else that she wants to uh, add about our collaborative work. Thank you. The uh, work we did together are something I grew up with. I grew up hearing these stories. And then I went and read anthropological books. I read many of them. Some of them I didn't complete because I was in disagreement with what they were saying. <coughs> They didn't know thing it, so they made mistakes. And to talk explaining in English what the thing it were saying was just lost. So anyway, I I accidentally went and um, documented the oratory from my father's potlatch for his older brother. And uh, with this, uh, I, I was working on it when I uh, went up to Anchorage and then I showed it to Dick. And no, there was no getting rid of him after that. <laughs> he loves <lost> Lingit. <laughs> He's still here. <laughs> anyway, um, the um, material or the writing system has gone through a couple changes. But I won't talk about that. So, if you can speak Thlingit, you can read the Thlingit books. I'm sure you can, because that's how I started. I started to read uh, books by um, the uh, Bible translators, like I said yesterday. And uh, I was very happy to read the Tlingit, the way it's supposed to be read. And um, I had no idea there was such a world written about our thoughts and our language. So I was happy about that, and I ended up teaching it to, to students. Uh, these books are to help teachers and students of Tlingit. They're all literature of Tlingit, in one way or the other. And um, I'm very happy we got them off the press. Uh, we won a couple of prizes. Um, we won this one, uh, a prize from the American Book, Award. American Book Award in California. This one. Yeah. Was also an American Book Award. We also won American Book Award on this one. This is, these books are to help those who can speak Tlingit and also read, because I was able to. I'm just using my own self. I could. Um, talk Tlingit, and I could read 
English, but to read Tlingit was just really something else. I was flying for many years because I could read the books that uh, um, Gillian Story and uh, Connie Nash produced. These are the English ladies who went to Angoon and um, Yeah, just a moment, I have some books of my own. John and Charmin. What I did in here is try to be very Tlingit. I am a Tlingit. I can't get away from that. Um, <coughs> so, it's mostly Tlingit. And a uh, live woven with song. My family, uh, no matter what they did, they always seemed to be singing a song. So, I wrote the poetry in here with a song in mind. And that's mine. Thank you. It's, uh, I'm Sergey Khan. It's very humbling to be sitting here next to uh, Nora and Dick, whom I love dearly. They're my closest friends and colleagues, and I think their contribution to uh, Tlingit literature and folklore and culture is, is so enormous. It's just incredible. But also, I think it's symbolic on my left is Ishmael Hope, the next generation uh, of the future of Tlingit literature. And I can't help uh, make a note of that because there's the missing person here is Andy Hope, uh, his dad, who was a close friend and colleague and collaborator of, of these two folks, and of course his father and teacher, and a friend of mine. And the reason I'm mentioning it because in my own career as an anthropologist and a historian, Andy was instrumental and uh, so were Dick and Nora. And uh, maybe I'm getting a little sentimental, I just turned 60 and you take stock of what you've done. And exactly 35 years ago in 1978, I came to this town to just kind of scout out a project for my dissertation. And um, I met, and I went to Anchorage, met Dick and Nora, and they gave me their blessings, said you can do the work if you do it right, meet the right people, follow Tlingit protocol. And then a year later I came to Sitka where I did most of my research on the Tlingit Ko'ich and also the Russian church and its relationship with the Tlingit and what it meant to the Tlingit people over the years. And the first person I had a long, serious conversation with was Andy, who was the head of Sitka, STA at that time, Sitka Tribe, what was it called? Sitka Tribe of Alaska. And he introduced me to some wonderful people, the Littlefields and the Youngs, and the rest is history. So um, I just want to mention that because we're, we're honoring Andy tonight. As far as my own work, it's very different from what Dick and Nora do but, or have done, but it's related. And um, I wanted to um, shed a different light on the Tlingit Potlatch Memorial Party payoff has been called, or Kuih now, the term we use, because anthropologists have written about it more in terms of its economic role, its competitive nature, but not its spiritual dimension and its emotional dimension as a memorial party, as a ritual. And I had two advantages. One was uh, I had access to Russian sources, the early Russian accounts of that ceremony, 
like from Father Vinyaminov and others, because Russian is my first language, and also had the privilege of, through the uh, families that I mentioned, especially Charlotte Young's family, um, was um, invited to take part, or at least first as a guest and then as adopted member of the, the box house of the Kaguantan to, uh, to participate in these memorials as early as 1980. So it's been a long time. And um, later on also uh, became very close and was adopted into another uh, eagle clan, the Dakloedi, the killer whales, by Mark Jacobs, another wonderful man who became my older brother and, and a dear friend. So through these elders, I learned a lot about the culture and attended the ceremonies that they sponsored. So I got this, what I call, up close and personal uh, feeling for the, the ceremony. And of course, uh, a lot of the elders, mostly from Sitka and Angoon, but also this community, helped me uh, understand the ritual from inside. And so I wrote my dissertation and then uh, in 89 published the first book that I called Symbolic Immortality, uh, the Tlingit Potlatch of the 19th Century. And uh, it, it has done well, it got a lot of good reviews, but the best review was from some of the elders who said, you know, this is, uh, you're writing about us. And Mark Jacobs called me up and said, you're the first one who wrote about the way we feel when we lose someone. So that meant a lot. The book is out of print. Uh, I brought a few copies, which, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to, um, to, to sell today, but mostly it's out of print. It's still used in colleges. A lot of students have read it. Um, but I'm working on a second edition, so in a few years there'll probably be a new edition with some changes or some corrections. Unfortunately, I published the book before the oratory by Dick and Nora came out, so I couldn't use their wonderful speeches. Um, so uh, also Harold Jacobs has done a lot of work you know, on his website, the TNH website, where he writes about the Kuih. So I want to incorporate some of that. And also, this story ends in the uh, early 20th century. I want to write an epilogue talking about how the Kuih is alive and well and is still going very strong. My students at Dartmouth, where I teach, say when I talk about Lingith culture, they can feel uh, how excited I get. My eyes light up, so um, it's very important. Ten years later, in 1999, I published uh, this huge book, Another Doorstopper, as Dick says, called Memory Eternal, Thlingit Culture in Russian Orthodox Christianity Through Two Centuries. So it starts with the first missionaries coming to Sitka, with, uh, right in the, on the heels of Baranov, uh, and ends in uh, the time was when I was in Sitka, 1980. So it's a history, but it's a cultural history. And it argues that uh, the Tlingit people, why they were attracted to Orthodox Church and how they made it their own. Because the families that I was close to in Sitka, in Angun, like Jimmy George family, Charlie Joseph family, uh, Littlefields and others, uh, their understanding of and their feelings about the Russian Church, there was something very uh, Tlingit about it. So this is based heavily on the Russian documents, which again, nobody's ever used before, but also on interviews with the elders, who in, in 1980, they could still talk about the 1900s. So uh, I think I arrived at the right time, because today, this would be hard to do. Very few of the elders. I'm also thinking of Ed's mom, Cecilia, gave me a lot of information on Juna Russian Church and the Tlingit community. So this was, a, this was a very good project. So I'll just mention third book and then I'll wrap it up. Uh, in the last few years, I've been working on a very different project uh, in the collection that Jim Smart oversees. The among the documents, he only mentioned books but in documents, but they're photographs. The wonderful photographic collection, some of you probably visited and looked at them, but I urge everyone, there's so many photographs dealing with the Tlingit people. Uh, and one of the collections is the Sobolev collection. Uh, pictures taken by Vincent Sobolev, the 
paternal uncle of a recently deceased, our wonderful elder, Walter Sobolev, and uh, um, uncle to, uh, uh, great uncle to Ross Sobolev, who I think is in the room. And people have used some of these pictures. I've seen them in Tlingit homes, but um, I wanted to uh, bring out the book with all his best pictures. He, there are 700 plates, but only about 100 could be brought out, and I think I brought out the best. And not just, of course, the most important ones are of Tlingit uh, leaders and Tlingit people wearing the atu, but there are also pictures of Tlingit people at work, working in the Kilisno factory, fishing, uh, Fourth of July celebrations, family. And then there are also pictures of white people and Creoles, Russian people, working and socializing, and actually shows that people did cross these racial barriers. It wasn't all divided sharply. And then there's a lot of stuff on the Sobolev family. I felt it's important because there's a big family and it's all now Tlingit family. So for this area um, and for Angun, this is a very important book. And I think, again, without uh, Harold's help and also at the last minute I had linguistic questions for Dick and Nora and Lance at Twitchell and they really helped me. So I have several new projects, but I don't want to take up more time. So I'll pass the microphone to Ish. Gunchish. All right, Gunchish. Keep this short and sweet. <clears throat> Half an hour. <laughs> uh, well, it's it's just wonderful to be here with with people. Dennis's talk um, and and his colleagues here. You know, um, Peter's essay, The Sword and the Shield, helped me. You know, inspired me to spend you know, months and months researching Alaska Native land claims and to, to write a draft at least and do a workshop of, of a play based on the Alaska Native Brotherhood and Sisterhood. And uh, Sergei's uh, books, I've, you know, I've read Symbolic Immortality multiple times. They get recommended by elders to read to, to help to understand the Kuik. That, that um, uh, if it's living, if it's alive, if you have the elders practicing, if you have Tlingit speakers, you can work with uh, literacy. And, and that's what I want to ha have my remarks for. I read, uh, I read uh, constantly the work of Dick and Nora Daunhauer. Read it aloud, the, the Tlingit speeches, the Tlingit uh, stories by those amazing elders that they spent time with. And I listened to the the recordings of my my uh, uh, iPod, uh, and just constantly while I'm doing dishes, while I'm around around the house, laying around, I listen to the recordings, and it's a combination of that, combination of this literacy. I think that if you spend time, you know, I spend time with uh, Paul Markser, Ken Kadunik, you know, with Nora. Keokne and Richard, I spend time at their house. I call them up. Cyril George Kafkau. You know, I've learned Tlingit language through Marsha Hotch, Kuneo T, Florence Shakely, you know, Kakath At. You know, I've I've spent time with these people who are knowledgeable and then practicing being at and involved and active at the Kuik, you know, and listening to stories. You know, we have uh, George Davis, um, not the um, there are two other George Davises uh, that were amazing Tlingit elders as well, but there's one, uh, Henry Davis's brother, um, George Davis, uh, from his family from Cake. He lives in uh, Lemon Creek. Tells amazing stories, just like the elders from over 100 years ago um, have told. That we have people like that still alive and around. And so my point is, that if we can spend time, it, it's like we're tuned into Tlingit Tundatani, uh, Tlingit ways of thinking, if we spend time in that community. And we have to find that sort of true north, that what Nora alludes to when talking about uh, Tlingit thinking, talking about being Tlingit through and through. And if we spend time doing that, um, if we come out of a native community, that gives us that, that grounding in that uh, worldview. And then we can use literacy to supplement it. 
but we have to have that grounding first. And, and that's really an in interest of mine, that you could see where there's those success stories, that it's not an either, either or between literacy and orality. You know, one example I could think of is a, a Slavic epic singer that was deeply studied by, uh, you know, one of um, the scholars that Richard uh, talks about a lot, Albert Lord. His name was Avdom Medvedevich, and he grew up powerfully in the tradition, that Homeric epic singing tradition, in that language. But he was sometimes read some stories that were recorded from over a hundred years ago. He was, it was read aloud to him. He, he didn't know how to read, but it was read aloud to him. And just automatically, because he knew that tradition, he was tuned into that tradition, he was able to then tell that story that he heard read. So you see what I'm saying? You could go into that um, that life way, that way of thinking, that way of being, you could go into that with the tools of literacy if you're grounded in that tradition. So, so that's just my thought and uh, my, my concern, and I think particularly in areas like the arts and other areas, my concern is how sometimes there's a, a romantic Western worldview um, English ways of speaking, English, English circuits of thought that are being um, maybe imposed on Tlingit. And so the balance is English is a tool, but the worldview of English doesn't need to impose itself, doesn't need to impose itself on our ancestral ways of knowing and being. So, Gunachish. Thank you, Isha. I'm Peter Metcalf, um, and I organized this panel, I guess, in part to give myself a chance to sit with this distinguished panel. But the, the downside is um, I'm going to give myself five minutes so y you folks can get out of here and take a break and, um, and enjoy the book sale that we've set up outside these doors. And this is thanks to Harside Books. I um, talked them into bringing down all their Clinkett-related books. and um, including books uh, that were published by these authors. And we'll have an author signing immediately following this. I'd like to thank Deb Reifenstein and Susan Hinckley for um, agreeing to do this. And um, one of the things you'll find at the table is this four-page uh, complete Clinkett library, which is, of course, incomplete. It's a work in progress. and. Um, I was completing it just early this morning, or trying to um, get it in shape. But mostly it's just books that um, panelists here recommended, as well as myself. And um, uh, among those, um, well, <laughs> one of the ones I, I, I missed, and I'll, I'll just mention this, I don't want to give it too much emphasis, but um, I found it to be a very revealing book. It was just published in 2008, and it's called The Fisherman's Frontier, The People and Salmon of Southeast Alaska, published by David Arnold. And it really opened my eyes to a couple things. And one is, and I'll just mention very briefly, is the um, myth of what might be called the myth of salmon traps. And the issue has been so, so, somewhat hijacked by, as an environmental issue. and. I don't think you can read this book and come out with that attitude. Um, I think they were very efficient and probably, you know, as you were going to do rational fishing, it was probably the most rational way to do it. But what it did, indisputably, was drive native people into Im impoverished native, native people, people who were doing quite well, thank you very much, up until the point in which floating fish traps were stationed along the coastal areas. and command, you know, it wasn't just they were taking all the fish. What they were doing really was lowering the market value of fish. And that's the interesting story there that you can find in this book. And it's not listed on our complete Clinkett library, but well worth reading. Um, one of the projects I've been most proud of being involved with was with um, uh, Isha's father, Andy Hope, and when we um, produced the 
uh, Clinkett Country poster, what we call it for shorthand, but it's really a list of all the Clinkett tribes or Clinkett clans and clan houses and their locations th throughout Southeast as best we could determine. And 99% uh, of it is Andy's research in the last couple of years since his death in 2008. There's been a few additions, so I'd say it's probably 99.9 percent .9 Andy's work when I think about it. But um, there have been a few changes. I got into an extended debate about Mink and Martin, uh, the Mink and Martin house, uh, north and south, and we uh, solved that problem by just putting a slash between Mink and Martin. But that change is in the most recent edition. So. Um, We've had probably, I'd say with this most recent printing of 500, we've had um, close to 2,000 copies of this poster printed. So 1,500 of them are out there, and um, hopefully they get in every classroom in southeast Alaska, because I find this poster to be the Rosetta Stone of Clinkett clan, clans and clan houses. You can really track how um, some houses were in uh, half a dozen villages, others were only in, in one or two villages, and it really helps you track lineage. And I've, I've helped a couple of my native friends figure out which houses and um, which clans and houses they came from using that map. Um, one of the books I um, published and was recently republished is Earning a Place in History. We have 20 of these um, that were donated by Shiatica. It's the story of the, Chiatic, the Sitka Native Claims Corporation, Chiatica, and um, it was first published in 1999 and then republished in 2011. Um, and so th it was donated by Chiatica and all the uh, proceeds of the $20 per copy will go to the Klan Conference. Um, this is a book about a native corporation, but it pretty much can be extrapolated um, what is in here can be extrapolated to most of the corporations of Southeast Alaska. And as you may know, they're quite different from um, uh, the corporations of Northern Alaska. So, um, you know, it's pretty much a regional book, but there's, it's a narrative style with um, kind of a quasi oral history followed by a, a extensive end notes. So if you have any interest in Alaska Native corporations and their history, um, a lot of that information is in this book. Uh, and I'd like to close by just talking about the, short and the Sword and the Shield for a moment. And this is a, a book um, I'm preparing to publish. It's based on the essay we wrote as a result of this grant we got from Alaska Humanities Forum. Um, this was literally the last project I worked on with Andy. It was his idea to get the grant, and I worked with him on this grant, and it was for the state um, state of Alaska experience project, and um, we got a fifty thousand dollar grant, and that funded the research. Unfortunately, when we got the the grant, um, Andy knew about it before he died. But by the time the project really got started, uh, Andy had passed away, and I felt to me to complete it. And I had a lot of great help, um, including uh, Steve Langdon and. Um, most especially uh, Kathy Ruddy, who is unfortunate pers personal circumstances um, prohibit her from being here and being a major participant. But hopefully we'll see Kathy at some point. She's a retired uh, attorney, and, um, and it was through the discussion she and I had and her research that we were able to um, really pull out a part of Alaska history that hadn't been told before, and that was how the Alaska Native Brotherhood and Sisterhood saved Aboriginal rights during the statehood period when they were most under most threat of being uh, settled prematurely or entirely extinguished. And had the AMB and the ANS not stood guard on those rights, there would have been no Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. And subsequently, there would have been no Alaska National Interest Conservation Act, which as uh, most of us know, put about 80 uh, million acres of Alaska into permanent wilderness protection. So 
there's a couple, I think there's two copies of the Sword and the Shield, the original essay. Um, I've expanded it to a book length and it was um, submitted to the University of Alaska Press, vetted by three historians and recommended for publishing. I'm doing the final changes on it and it'll be offered in uh, 2014 as part of the University of Alaska Press uh, 2014 offering. So. With that, I would like to um, bring this session to a close and invite you all to j join us on the, at the book sales table here immediately following. And Jim, would you close this? I'd be happy to, and I want to just leave you with the idea that the complete Lincoln Library is, of course, still being written, I think largely by people in this room. And I, I just wanted to, to remind you that the uh, the State Library collects published works, but we also collect, and I feel like some of the most important materials we have there are unpublished manuscripts, um, photo collections, videos, things that are being created by people in the community. And if you'd like any of your materials to become a part of the, the public uh, permanent record, uh, please don't hesitate. Thank you all so much for, uh, uh, for your participation. I just want to add that I think we owe a big round of applause to Peter Metcalf. He's a great photographer, publisher, historian, and he organized this, and I think his organizational skills are legendary. So.